Good evening and welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidates Forum. This first forum tonight, we're going to hear from the candidates that are running for the Ventura Unified School District in District 1. This is the first year that the Unified School District has been separated into individual districts. We are going to hear from our candidates in just a moment, but before we do that, I'd like to ask everyone to please stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you'll please join me, hand over heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the president of the League of Women Voters of Ventura County, Betsy Patterson. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you all. Um, I would just like to let you know that the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 after the passage of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. The suffragists recognized at that time that having the right to vote was not enough. The voters needed to be informed about the candidates and the issues in order to vote wisely. From its beginnings, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan organization, neither supporting nor opposing any particular candidate or any political party. Our mission is to register and educate voters, to advocate for fair voter legislation, and to encourage maximum voter turnout. We register voters throughout the county, uh, in the high schools and uh, college campuses, as well as any businesses that ask us to come in and register their, their employees. We host candidate forums like this. We distribute nonpartisan printed and online information on ballot propositions and all the candidates. And as David mentioned, the League of Women Voters is not just for men. We have been welcoming, uh, not just for women, we've been welcoming men since 1974, becoming one of the first exclusionary clubs to open its doors to the opposite sex. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, simply stated, our mission is empowering voters, defending democracy. So I'd ask you please, if you would like more information about the League of Women Voters, please stop by our table in the back on your way out uh, and consider uh, joining us and becoming a member and uh, pr helping to uh, empower voters and defend democracy. And I want to say thank you to you all for coming out tonight to uh, listen to the candidates and thank you for letting uh, the League of Women Voters host the candidate forum here tonight. Thank you. So the way this process works is we want to take your questions. We have volunteers who have little index cards and pencils. Raise your hand at any time and we'll come around and bring you a card. You can fill out a question and we'll try to get to as many as we can tonight. It's very helpful if you write legibly so I can read it. That makes things a lot easier and uh, we'll do what we can to get them all answered. So we are going to begin with an opening statement. Each candidate will have one minute. Candidates, you'll see the timer when you have only 15 seconds remaining. We are going to begin with our first candidate, Tomas Luna. Buenas noches, tengan todos y cada uno de ustedes. Quiero enfatizar, agradecer a todos y cada uno de ustedes por darme esta oportunidad de estar aquí. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you all of you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, believe it or not, I will do my best to be, be your candidate. As you know, my name is Tomás Juarico Luna. I'm a resident for this community for more than 25 years. I'm a member of ILAC and DILAC, uh, comedians, Latino comedians uh, the school district. Also, I'm a Latino representative for I mean, LCAP and uh, for the school district, Ventura here. And I'm so happy to be here and, and, and continue to represent my community. I believe that uh, uh, school, it's necessary to have I me, mean, you know, different representation and new ideas to make it forward uh, the successful future for the children. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Our next candidate is Anthony Krizwicki. Good evening, my name is Anthony Krizwicki. I am honored to be here. Um, I'm gonna thank the League of Women Voters for putting this together. And I wanna thank all of you that came and attended today um, as thank you for participating in our civics um, and our democracy. I also wanna thank Velma 
And I want to thank Thomas for continuing to par participate in our democracy. Um, I'm running for school board, and I have a platform based on my views, which are social, social justice and environmental justice. And I think that our schools can do a, a better um, when it comes time to looking at our disposables. Um, I would like to see plastics, single-use plastics eliminated from our schools. Um, that's one of the big things on my platform. I Thank you, Anthony. We'll have to stop you there. That one minute goes quickly, doesn't it? So, Velma, our next candidate is Velma Lomax. One minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having this tonight. Thank you for coming. I have been on the school board for Ventura Unified School District for 25 years. Some of you may say, why does she want to do this again? Well, because I love kids. I taught school for 19 years. Uh, I taught vocational education. And I have a passion for students, and I have a passion for doing what's right in the community. I grew up in a very small town in Northern California where my father was the elected judge. And we always, our family did what was right for people and other people, not just ourselves. I love this school district. I love the kids, period. And I want to continue to help make sure that everything, times have changed. When I started teaching 19 years ago, it's a whole different ball game than teaching kids now. And that's what I want to do is to be around for four more years to make sure that we get kids and we get them educated so they can be productive parts of society. Thank you. We'll now start with our questions. Anthony, you're up first. We're going to jump around as we do this. But Anthony, do you have any thoughts about a vocational education high school in the district, either converting one or creating a new high school focused on career education, vocational education? I love that idea. I believe that our school system not only needs to gear students for colleges, but also needs to gear students for going into the trades. Um, I also would love to see a vocational school focus on green energies, um, green jobs that are out there, focusing on solar um, and um, electrical, and um, I would definitely be for that. Thank you. Velma, same question to you. What are your thoughts about a dedicated high school for career technical education? Well, since I taught career and technical education for 19 years, I'm absolutely for it. I think that we put an awful lot of focus on a four-year college, and then we don't do the studies afterwards of how many students actually finished college, uh, where they went, were they job ready when they finished college. Many of my students that took my uh, technical classes at the high school are making you know, six-figure jobs and they haven't finished college yet, but they, could, they left high school ready to work. And regardless of whether you go to a four-year college or a high school, you have to be ready to work, as you know. We don't want our kids and grandkids living with us forever. So we, and, I mean, I have my grandson living with me, but I'm not saying that about him, just so you know. But really, it's very, very important because skills are necessary. And just because you go to a four-year college doesn't even mean you, mean you come out with skills. Thank you. Tomas, same question to you. What are your thoughts about a dedicated high school for education, vocational education? Absolutely. As right now, I mean, we see that it's very important to support those kids, especially, I mean, uh, the uh, double inversion uh, uh, English learners, because uh, we see that they're very behind, and uh, really we need to work on those, those I mean, students to make sure they have, I mean, uh, complete his careers. And the way that we can do that, it's a start since at the bottom. We, we cannot do things that there is already f forward. Let's work. They can have I mean, enough support to finish his I mean, careers. Thank you. Velma, we're going to start with you on the next question. What do you think is the biggest unmet need in the district, and how would you remedy that? Well, I really truly believe this. The biggest unmet need is that we don't pay our staff enough. Now, that's easy to say, and everybody said, but the piece of the pie, the biggest piece of the pie is salaries. But when you look at what the teachers have to do in the overcrowded conditions, and I'm not just talking about the teachers, but let's talk about the classified staff, the support staff. Um, and there's many, many things that are mandated by the federal or the state that are not funded. 
In our district alone, right across the top, $3 million comes out before we do anything for special education, which is mandated by the federal government. Then there's transportation issues in our town, the way it's laid out, that are not completely funded by the state. But we have to take care of that because we have to do what's right for kids. And so I think that we need to really look at and push, push, push our legislators to make this happen that we can get this turned back around. Because there's going to be a huge shortage of, of teachers within the next few years because nobody wants to do this. Okay, thank you. Tomas, same question to you. What do you believe is the biggest unmet need in the district? What would you do to fix it? I agree, same as Abel must say. Basically, it's, it's very important and, and it's very necessary. As right now, we know that we have a critical situation and, and we never know, but like she said, probably we will lose I mean, more I mean, uh, uh, instructors. And basically, uh, it's no doubt we need to support that issue and, and talk to the legislators to, to make sure bring some more funding to support this issue. It's, it's, it's very necessary. And Janet, she's here, and uh, thank you for your support. And we, we need to do that and as soon as possible because the teacher, that's the, the key to uh, uh, make a, a, a forward with the, the students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll start with... Uh, Let's see, I think we, did I catch everybody? Anthony, did I do? Anthony. Okay, Anthony, same question to you. What's the biggest unmet need in our school district? The biggest unmet need in our school district is money. <laughs> well, there's not enough of it to go around. Um, I believe we need to uh, find, petition, uh, petition at the state level to try to get um, more money allocated to school districts. Um, especially our school district. We do need to um, look at our pay scale. Um, you know, we look at some of our support staff out there who are not making $15 an hour yet. Um, and, you know, to live in Ventura County is uh, very expensive. So we need to make sure that we pay the people who are working here um, adequate, adequate amount of money to live here. Um, and that's what I have, thanks. Thank you. Anthony, we'll go ahead and start the next question with you. What's your position on charter schools? Where do you stand? That is a very good question. Um, charter schools, I believe, um, have their place, but I believe also locally charter schools take money out of public education system um, where the money is, as we just talked about, is very well needed in our public schools. So um, I would like to see our money stay within the public school system. Thank you. Tomas, you're next. What's your position on charter schools? I believe, I mean, that those kind of school sets, I mean, uh, I'm not going to say it's the best, but, you know, in the meantime, like uh, my partner say, we probably need to see if we can uh, uh, have only one, I mean, a, a, a idea with the school district and not separate different, I mean, uh, institutions. Probably one is going to be better and more stronger. Okay, thank you. Velma, we'll wrap up with you on charter schools. What are your, where do you stand? Well, it's true that charter schools can take away the money from your district in that you don't have the student in the average daily attendance at your school district and they're at a charter. But I think that what we need to do is embrace the charters and find out why are parents wanting their kids to go to a charter school? What are we not doing in public education that your child is getting in charter school? The last two years that I taught, because I taught for the Ventura County Office of Education and Career and Technical Education, they moved me to Ace Charter High School, and I have to tell you, the kids that had ADD and ADHD, they flourish in that kind of an environment. So I believe that we need to look at what we're doing in our schools and make our classrooms an attractive, wonderful, engaging place for students, and then we wouldn't lose them to charter schools. Charter schools are not gonna go away though, folks. So we have to work in our district to make sure that we're offering courses that the parents want for their kids. Thank you. Tomas, we're going to start with you on the next question. You've all talked about having more money. So if there were more money for schools, Tomas, what would be your top three priorities? Well, we, I do not have I mean, only three. I have more than that. But, uh, <laughs> but basically, I mean, uh, funding for extracurricular activities that is important for, for the kids. Uh, uh, the other one that I, I never hear from the district, I mean, uh, 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 school boards, 
more facilities. As you can see, you know, West Side Ventura Avenue is uh, um, building a lot of army construction, and, and a lot of people is going to come here to, to new families at the West Side. And we need to see if we can build in more facilities to have I mean, more classrooms for the people. Okay, so, thank, thank you. And we'll go to Velma next. So what would be your top three priorities if more money was available? Well, it depends. You didn't say if it was unlimited. But uh, <laughs> if never. I had my wish and I had my way, of course, we'd have smaller class sizes. And we would have um, exciting, fun, engaging classes for kids with unlimited resources for the, to buy the robotics parts or the, uh, the music equipment or whatever we needed. I think that... Um, Wow, that would be awesome. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years and I've never really thought about what would I do if I had unlimited resources. Of course, you would have an opportunity to look at the salary situation, look at your classroom situations. Maybe uh, you have to be careful about facilities versus what money can be spent on kids and what has to be spent on facilities. But if it was just free for all, make sure all the classrooms were air conditioned um, and that kind of stuff. I think there's so many things, but absolutely my focus would be to make sure that we have engaging classes with resources for kids to take on projects and be able to finish them. Thank you. Anthony, same question to you. If there was more money, what would be your top three priorities? My top three priorities would be to create more schools, build, build more schools and so we can have smaller classrooms. That would be one. My second one would be to make sure that our classrooms, especially our arts and music programs, are fully funded um, so we don't have to ask parents and try to find money other, other ways that we typically tend to do these days. Um, and my next one would be to create a green technologies program which would teach green technologies. Open-ended. <laughs> Okay, so Velma, we're gonna start with you on the next one. What do you believe to be the strengths and weaknesses of the Common Core Standards or curriculum? Oh, I knew that question. Oh, you have a minute, <laughs> one <laughs> no, whole minute. Okay. It's okay. You know, Common Core, I think the conception of Common Core was important. We weren't actually teaching the kids how to practically apply what they were learning in the classroom. But somewhere along the line, I have to be careful how I say this. In education, and I was an educator, we tend to sometimes cloud things with a lot of different things. And I think that right now, Common Core is a mess. And I think that we need to, and we are, we're lobbying the state and to, to find out what we can do. What's happened is we've changed our math and everything so many times in the last 10 years or 12 years in our district that I don't think the kids even know math, to tell you the truth. I know the parents don't. But um, Common Core is a requirement, and we have to teach it. We all don't like it. But I think that we need to continue to work on making sure that it becomes understandable. Is that a good way to say it? Thank you. Anthony, same question. What do you believe to be the strengths and weaknesses of the Common Core curriculum? Um, the, I guess the strengths, um, I would say, would be that um, we're teaching. <laughs> um, uh, the, the weaknesses is that it's been um, standards, are, standards are set that are um, expected to be followed to the T and it eliminates teachers' creativity and ways to engage with the students. And I think that each student learns individually and uniquely and we need to look at ways, like Velma was talking about, to work with the state to try to find more lead way to work around it and um, that way our teachers can have some more freedom to teach and engage our students practically at their level. Thanks. And Tomas, we'll wrap up with you. Your thoughts, strengths and weaknesses of Common Core. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I mean, like, like I mean, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, we need to make sure, I mean, that the instructors, you know, uh, helps, you know, and work with uh, the students and individual to make a more stronger and more, more ethically, I mean, uh, his, I mean, careers at this point. Okay. 
Thank you. And uh, Tomas, we'll start the next question with you. So this is the first year of districts. This is District 1 for the Ventura Unified. Tomas, do you believe there is an issue that students, or for students in District 1, that may differ for students in other parts of Ventura? In other words, is there issues over here that are different from the rest of the city? And what would you do to help resolve those issues? Absolutely. I mean, this, these things, it's not just from today. For many years ago, we see that it uh, seems like it's pretty much similar, but it's not. I mean, the West Side Ventura Avenue, especially here, I mean, the uh, school shared and way. And uh, we see that needs a lot of uh, resources to improve our English learners. And uh, I'm pretty sure we also need uh, uh, to make sure, I mean, uh, helps the, the parents, because most of the parents, they are low-income families, and they not have I mean, access to help these, these students. And the way that we can be successful and, and be better, the, almost the same to the other areas, is to uh, find some I mean, programs or additional programs for the kids to help those kids to, to, to improve I mean, their I mean, uh, uh, grades and help at the same time the, the, the parents to, to have I mean, probably a, a, a two or three classes a week to start to learn, see what happens about the, the, the Gonna have the to language. stop you there. Okay, thank you. Anthony, you're up next. Is there an issue that you believe is different for District 1 than other parts of the city? And what would you do to resolve that issue? I believe that we have a social justice issue in District 1 um, where we, if we look, if you look at the school's report cards, you'll see that um, when you look at the testing and stuff for the state that we're lower than state averages at a few of our schools on the avenue. And what, what do I contribute that to? I contribute that, um, there's a lot of things that contribute to that, but one thing that we can do as a school district is engage with the students have our teachers engage with the students and also have the teachers engage with school counselors, school psychologists, and bring everybody into the fold and also contacting the parents more, which will add a lot of labor hours, but it's needed to actually give, give these students a chance and, and help lift them up when they're not doing their best. Also, I believe that the ACES program is something that's very important, the after-school program where kids attend and can have homework help and vocational help while there are a lot of people on the avenue and I actually- I have to stop you there. So. Got it. Okay, Velma, we'll hear from you, please. What issue do you think is different for students in District 1? Well, first of all, let's understand one thing. We were required by law to go into districts. Primarily, the purpose of that was to make it easier for people to run for office, because to run for office in an entire area can be very, very costly, but to run for office in a smaller area would make give everybody an opportunity to become an elected official. Once we are elected, we still represent the entire district. But to answer your question, I have always been from the west side. I've lived in Oakview for 40, 44 years. My daughter went, uh, my grandchildren went right here at Data. I was a PTSA president here at Data when it was called De Anza. I was a PTSA president at Ventura High School. And I've always seen that there, in the past there's been a disparity for the West Side schools. And I fought to make that a difference. I have 15 seconds to tell you. We have made this school a school of choice and, and really increased the enrollment so we could offer more programs. We've added, um, Special programs down at e Sheridan Way and E.P. Foster, and I gotta stop, so there you go. Read Thank my you. literature. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this will be our last question, and then we'll have the closing statements. We're gonna start with Anthony, and it's an important issue we haven't talked about yet. As the school district's share of the pension costs keeps increasing, and it's estimated to be about 8% now, and it could go up as high as 19% in the next, uh, by 2021, how will this impact teacher salaries? And if you are on the board, what will you do in the budget to be able to fund that pension increase? That's a great question, and that is an issue that is coming up. Um, it's all over social media about the pensions increasing, and that's just not at school board level. Um, we need to look at ways to increase our our money intake. That's what we were talking, I mentioned earlier, we need more money. And um, how are we gonna get that money? Um, we're gonna have to be creative. We're gonna have to look at ways to rent out um, meeting spaces at some of our schools to public 
to public groups to try to bring in some income. We're going to have to look at other ways to raise money and also try to get money from the state. Thanks. Thank you. Velma, same question to you. What will we do, or if you're uh, on the board, what's uh, the budget changes you would enact, Me? yes, okay. as far as dealing with the pension increase? Well, you know, we are one of the few districts left in the, probably the state, I know definitely in the county, that still pay the entire benefit package, dental, vision, and health for our employees. They're not required to pay a proportional share unless they're not a full-time employee. So, of course, you're, everybody looks at that first, and I'm not sure that's the way to go. Uh, but you got to understand is as we raise salaries, then their pensions are going to go up as well. So it's a, it's, it's a shuffling game that you end up playing with money. How do we fix it? You know, that's why we hire the best in our financial department so they can look at those things. As a school board, we can have input to that, but it's really not the final solution is not on our plate. That's why we hire the best uh, people in place to do that. But do we have to consider it all the time? Absolutely. And money's always going to be an issue. Always. Like I said, if you raise the salaries, now the pensions go up because it goes up proportionately. And if you make, I'm sorry. Thank, uh, thank you, Velma. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little different when you're not the teacher, right? It's cutting people off. Tomas. We're going to wrap up the same question with you. So if you're elected and the budget, uh, the cost of pensions increase up to 19% in the next few years, what will you do to uh, deal with the budget increase? Well, as always, you know, money, it's, it's the issue. And, uh, uh, and basically, like, uh, uh, if we, we do not have I mean, uh, uh, control in that issue, and, and in the meantime, I mean, I, I believe I mean, the, the school board they can support issues and, uh, and, and make it better, whatever it is necessary, but it's not in, in, in their hands to, to, to decide, you know, what we can do. We can support and we can, you know, read it and, and, and make sure that both parts, they are in, in, in equal. Thank you. We're going to uh, begin our closing statements in a moment, but before we do that, how about a round of applause for these three candidates? Immediately after this forum at 7.05, we're going to start a city council candidates forum. If you are one of our four city council candidates, you can meet Cheryl over on that far side if you'll start making your way over there so that we can quickly switch and get ready for that next one. Because these people paid a lot of money to be here. I want to make sure they get a good show. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank all the volunteers. To put on something like this takes a lot of volunteers from the League of Women Voters. Thank you. You met Betsy Patterson earlier, Barbara Doyle's here, Cheryl, Maddie, and Karen. We're doing our timing. Doris is in the back helping along with Pat. Carol did so much. I don't have enough time to explain everything that she did for tonight. So thank you all to our volunteers. With that, we'll go ahead and begin our closing statements. It'll be in the reverse order, and we're, uh, that works perfectly. Velma, you can go first while we do a microphone change on Tomas. Velma, you have one minute. Thank you. Thank, oh, is mine off? Oh, you can hear me. I could just use my teacher voice. Thank you very much. One thing that I always uh, try to impress during the election process, having done this for 25 years, although I haven't had to run since 2009, I want you to know that. Um, any one school board member is just that, one school board member. It takes a majority of five to get anything done. So regardless of whether it's here or any board, it, is, it could be the city council, it could be the community college district, each candidate is just one of however many is seated on their panel. So we do not act independently. We have to work together. I've enjoyed for 25 years working with this school district and seeing it grow. We have a brand new superintendent one year. All of our assistant superintendents are new, and if I'm reelected, I will be the longest seated school board member, and then one next to me would be only two years. So I would ask that you support me so that we have consistency and history on the board. And I think in 25 years, I've shown you what my history is. Thank you very much. Our next candidate is Anthony Chriswicki. I want to thank everybody for being here and the League of Women Voters as well again. Um, I would love to have your vote and I would love the chance to serve on your board. I have professionally, I've 
have a hotel restaurant institutional management degree. I can read budgets, I can balance budgets, which is a big part of the board, and I am willing to utilize my knowledge and time to make our school board, make our schools better. Um, I would also like to see us implement more civics engagement in our schools, where when our kids are in high school, they will have time and be encouraged, not just to volunteer, but actually engage in local politics. I want to see them, I, I would love to see, you know, tons of high school kids running, you know, when you, once you turn 18, really being involved, and we don't have that nowadays, and I would love to see that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And our last candidate tonight is Tomas Luna. Yeah, well, as always, you know, I appreciate your support in, in, in this event, you know, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, I really, you know, have uh, enthusiasm and, and leadership. As you know, I'm the Westside Community Council Chairman. I'm a, a, a very active parent at the school district in ELAC and DILAC, English learners' parents. Uh, also, I'm a, a very Latino uh, leader involved in uh, LCAP and from the school district and I believe you the, together we can make it forward. I understand that you know my mission is to 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 focus and, and, and support the kids because I believe the children are the, the future for this community. Together we can make forward. Si se puede. Thank you all of you for being here and support me. Both for Tomas Huaricoluna November 6th. Thank you very much. Thank you. How about another round for all three candidates? Okay, we're, we're going to take a short break. This has been the League of Women Voters Forum for the candidates for Ventura Unified School District, number one. If you're leaving, again, there's membership information on the back table, even a little donation jar if you enjoyed tonight. Other candidates, we're gonna get you right up. So thank you all, we'll be right back. <laughs>